Okay, um, it's, a, it's a great pleasure to be invited to chair the first session of this Monsoon Assemblages uh, Symposium. My name is Ed Wall, I'm the academic lead for landscape at the University of Greenwich and I sort of dabble in one or two other institutions or maybe stick my nose in a few other institutions. Um, and I'll be chairing this first session um, which has two presentations. Firstly, Lindsay Bremner um, will be talking on sediments as method. And secondly, Ifor Duncan will be talking about sedimentary witness. Okay. Uh, after the two presentations, I will make it, be making a short response and then I'll be uh, putting the expectation on all of you to uh, be asking very, uh, very bright and stimulating questions. Um, and then following the session, we'll then go into the keynote session, okay? The first, se first presentation is by Lindsay. Uh, Lindsay Bremner is Professor of Architecture at the University of Westminster and Principal Investigator of Monsoon Assemblages. She's an award-winning architect and writer on Johannesburg whose book, Writing the City, into Being, Essays on Johannesburg, 1998-2008, won the Jane Jacobs Book Award in 2011. Before Monsoon Assemblages, Lindsay's research explored socio-spatial transformations in the Indian Ocean world framed by the idea of folded ocean. She's formerly the head of architecture in departments in Philadelphia and Johannesburg. Um, incidentally, um, that's where I first met Lindsay, to my great pleasure as a student. Um, and understood very much Johannesburg and uh, South Africa through her, her writing. Uh, Lindsay holds a DSC architecture from the University of Witzvaterland in Johannesburg. Um, Lindsay, I'll give you the microphone. Thank you very much. It's actually quite embarrassing to be opening your own conference, but that's kind of how it worked out, so bear with us. Um, at least I get it over and done with so I can enjoy the rest of the, the symposium. Okay, um, I'm going to, I'll, I'll try and stick to time. Ed, please cut me short if I don't. Right. I'm going to be doing something that's quite raw and new today um, that I haven't done before. It might not work at all. Um, and I would really appreciate comments and questions afterwards. Um, on sediment as method. Um, this is a thought experiment to generate concepts aimed at invoking a monsoonal imaginary for these uncertain times. Sediment does not generally feature in a geological imaginary because it's too mobile nor does it feature in a hydrological imaginary because it's too dry. However, it's very materially present in a monsoonal imaginary. Thinking with it, I hope, will generate new concepts through which to think through rather than about the earth and to afford political power to the elemental forcefulness of the earth itself as a way of gaining more understanding of the monsoon. Sediment brings together two of the Earth's great cycles, the tectonic and the hydrological. It reminds us that the Earth is not just an inert mass of rock, an enormous sphere of silicon and metals, but a dynamic system powered from the inside by the heat generated by the radioactivity of its core and the Earth's second en energy source, the sun, which drives the Earth's fluid envelope of air and water to create powerful weather systems. So I beca began to become fascinated in sediment as where these two great cycles, the hydrological and the tectonic, intersect. Sediment is the way the earth recycles itself, and in doing so, acquires a history. Sediment, as the earth's great recycling mechanism and archive, means that each grain of sediment is thick with memories of other places, other interactions, other altitudes, and other times. 
What I'm going to do with my time today is to think through three analytical concepts that have emerged as I have thought with sediment as a way of reorientating my understanding of the monsoon. And those concepts are weathering, which probably most people are familiar with, saltating, which I don't imagine too many are familiar with, and alleviating. So to be begin with weathering. Weathering in the concept of this presentation is what happens to rocks when they are exposed to weather, when weather becomes geomorphological. In their paper, Weathering Climate Change and the Thick Time of Transcorporeality, Estrida Neymanis and Rachel Walker use the word weathering to describe the common space and co-joined time of human bodies and weather. Contrary to common imaginaries, such as that conveyed by the BBC weather report each evening, weather is not a background phenomena of weather fronts, wind, rain, air, and snow, in which we humans live out our lives. Instead, we are thick with climatic interactions. We weather, we are weather bodies. Our bodies are both archives and makers of weather. In other words, the ebb and flow of meteorological life transits through us, just as the actions, matters, and meanings of our own bodies return to the weather in a myriad of ways. Nimanis and Walker call this, after Tracy Alamo, the transcorporeality of humans and weather. While in, their concept, while in their concept world, bodies are human bodies, it seems to me that the practice of transcorporeality, material exchanges across bodies, takes place between rocks and weather too, or this was my hypothesis. In fact, the more than human is implicit in Neymanis and Walker's thinking. They say, like these trees, or I would add these rocks, we are all of us, each of us, weathering. In his book, The Earth After Us, stratigrapher Jan Jelesevich describes one of the weathering processes at work in rocks, known as chemical weathering. The Earth's crust, he tells us, was originally formed when primordial earth rock, which is called igneous rock, crystallized out from the Earth's molten core billions of years ago. Its molecular structure was formed at high temperatures and pressures in the Earth's interior. Once cooled and exposed to the atmosphere, rainwater, and repeated heating and cooling, these silicate mineral structures simply disintegrate and they reassembled into minerals that are stable in their cooler, warmer, wetter surroundings, most of them turning into quartz, which is the most common mineral found in sand and sediment. Or they grow from solution on the surface or pores of rocks, which start to resemble chemical gardens, into microscopic flake-like twistles of clay, which then flake off and erode. Thus, weather, far from being external to the rock, becomes written into its molecular structure. Like all living beings, rocks, when exposed to weather, become weather bodies. And they, in fact, they have what geologists call weather fronts moving through them. They are thick with climatic interactions whose mechanisms are intimate, molecular, and transmogrative. I just thought I'd take an aside to show these two maps, one of which is a map of the underground of Johannesburg, the, hill, the Hospital Hill series of geological strata, and the other of which is a map, a meteorological map drawn for us in Yangon in Myanmar, just to show the kind of common representational depiction of earth strata and atmospheric pressure. And this seemed to be an extraordinary useful visual connection of the fact that the earth is strata all the way through. All the way through weather, we have strata, just as there are strata all the way through the earth. Once freed from their middle earth molecular strictures, 
particles of rock join the weather, so to speak. They are transported away from their parent rock by gravity, wind, and water, in the company of which they move by what is known as saltation. This is a word from the Latin salire to leap and saltare to dance. It describes how when suspended in and carried along by water or air, sediment particles frolic, tumble, and bounce along. In thinking about this motion, oh, that was supposed to loop, I'm sorry. You, you have to look closely to watch the moving particles. In thinking about this motion, I'm indebted to Kimberly Peters' paper, Drifting Towards Mobilities at Sea, in which she proposed that thinking through drifting as a mode of mobility unlocks knowledge about the earth beyond that of solid earthiness. It seems to me that saltating, the dance of sediments on the move, offers such insights too. For these tiny mountains in transit have now entered a world of fluid dynamics that force them to suspend their rocky assumptions and the security of knowing what will happen next. They become lively transcorporeal water bodies barely distinguishable from the dynamics and the characteristics of the rivers that carry them. They become synonymous with fluid velocity, riverbed, river width, depth, and gradient in an interactive, turbulent process of mutual becoming. It's working this time, the loop, that's good. And this is an early diagram done in 1936. It's called the Shields Diagram, which I see as the sort of choreograph of the dance of the sediments. At low fluid velocities, the loose material rolls downstream, staying in contact with the bed surface. Here, the forces exerted by the fluid on the particle are only enough to roll it around the point of contact with the surface, something like a break dance. Once the fluid velocity reaches a certain critical value, the drag and lift forces exerted by the fluid lift particles against the force of gravity from the surface. They are accelerated by the fluid, but they pull downwards by gravity at the same time causing them to travel in roughly ballistic trajectories. If a particle has obtained sufficient speed from the acceleration by the fluid, it bounces up again and can eject or splash other particles, which propagates the process. So they're constantly bashing into each other and splashing each other along. Depending on the surface of the riverbed, the particle might also disintegrate on impact or reject much finer sediment from its surface. In the air, this produces something known as saltation bombardment and creates most of the dust in dust storms. This process, however, does not simply transport sediment. It also wears away and reshapes its particles, whose bumps, angles, or smoothness is a record of their tussles along the way. In this description of the dance of the sediments, you will have noticed that I have used militaristic terminology like ballistic trajectory, projectile, bombardment. For saltation is a mode of mobility in which a fluid transforms sediment particles into little missiles set against and reshaping each other and the environments they move through. And here I'm indebted for this animation to one of the students who might be here. I don't think she is. So this energy of the sediment particles in motion carries with it the potential for violence and sudden disruption. This is um, a, a, an animation of about 15 years showing the change of the course of river and the moving of the sedimentary islands um, <coughs> driven by the monsoon each year. In Bangladesh, this process produces what is known as the land of God only knows precarious nomadic units of land called chars that emerge from rivers that flow thick with sediment each year. This land cannot be mapped or legally owned or recorded in revenue papers because it moves around too quickly and too frequently. 
It has historically been occupied by transitory populations with artificial documents, who have no choice but to dance with the river and lead perilous, calamitous lives. Their land frequently deserts them, their shelters are devastated, crops are damaged, and livestock washed away. As new sandbars emerge each year, fierce, at times, violent struggles to occupy them ensue. These are overseen by local strongmen who exert unquestioned authority over the distribution of this precarious land and subject child dwellers to subservience. Attention to saltation, then, is key to understanding the world in its lively becoming and alerts us to the ways in which the very character of the Earth's movement itself has a politics. In this case, a clientelist, violent, almost feudal one. And finally, alleviating. As rivers slow down, they deposit sediment onto floodplains and pile it up on continental shelves. Some of it is deposited along the way, the coarser, heavier sand first while finer clay particles are carried all the way to the sea. Some of this is, is carried still further. This is, this is an image of the very top of the Bay of Bengal, and one can see these extraordinary sediment fans that spread out into the ocean. Some of it is carried still further by turbidity currents into deep oceans where it settles and sinks and buries its history until, disturbed by tectonic forces, it re-emerges as the folded strata of sedimentary rock. This is a, an image of the Bengal fan, which basically is the way the Himalayas have been redistributed for 2,000 kilometers down the Bay of Bengal. However, I want to conclude by stepping back from strata to talk about alluvium. To alluviate is a transitive verb from the Latin allure, meaning to wash against and leave traces of that material exchange behind, a wash of paint, for example. In the story I am following, alluviation refers to the ebb and flow of floodwaters and the sediments they leave behind as they recede each year. This redistribution of rubble, silt, clay, quartz, feldspar, and organic matter that a river has gathered from multiple sources on its journey to the sea is distributed onto the surface and seeps into the subsurface of the floodplains. At this point, sediment becomes soil. Sciences of measure are born, and the Earth's strata is transformed into territory. In Politics of Strata, Nigel Clark reminds us that it was this alluvial cycle that gave birth to territory in the first place. In the oldest storyline, we in the West can conjure up about territory. The idea was born when the geometricians of the Nile Valley retraced the borders of fields each time the floodwaters receded. From this apportioning of annually deposited alluvium, politics, property, and laws were erected. Territory, in other words, is a political technology of sediment. Contrary to modern conceptions of territory as static, bounded, and dry, it emerged dripping from the watery dynamics of alleviating rivers. And finally, to conclude, and I'm going to play, a, play out with a video, which is actually a remarkable um, um, coverage of a flash flood in the Himalayas um, in a place called Ladakh which was captured on film, um, that was brought about by what's called a westerly disturbance um, of the monsoon in the northern part of the Himalayas. Well, it's actually, a, it's not the monsoon, but that's far too technical for today. Okay, that's the Nile. So, where this thought experiment has brought me to, that going down, is to a sense of the dynamic interactive material exchanges that make up the terra infirma of this earth on which we dwell, and the extent to which its generativity is constitutive 
of politics. As Earth cycles become more jittery, less predictable and more violent, they remind us, in fact, of the monstrous and impolitic potential at all scales, from the molecular to the planetary. They ask us that the space of our political engagement with them be reimagined as post-human, transcorporeal, and intraconnected, recognizing, once again, to paraphrase Neymanis and Walker, the multitudes of bodies, including our own, that are all co-emerging in the uncertain makings of these weather times. Thank you. Lindsay, thank you very much. That was uh, fantastic and uh, spot on time as well, uh, which I'd expect um, organizing the event. Uh, our next presentation will be from uh, Eva Duncan, uh, giving a presentation on sedimentary witness. While uh, he prepares, I will uh, just read out some of his uh, achievements. Um, Eva Duncan is a London-based writer and researcher and currently PhD candidate at the Centre for Research Architecture at Goldsmiths. His current research concerns memory and climate politics with a specific focus on the complex relationships between political violence and watery spaces. In particular, the ways hydrologic properties are conceptualized, instrumentalized, and weaponized as borders regimes through extraction and as te technologies of obfuscation. Ifer, it's over to you, thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, this is a kind of a paper I've been working on for a while, but with a new bent to fit with the sedimentary, although it's always had a sedimentary element to it. Um, I'm going to start with a few epigraphs. Um, so, a much rehearsed one. From the moment the rains began to fall, the lands began to be worn away and carried to the sea. It is an endless, inexorable process that has never stopped the dissolving of rocks, the leaching out of their contained minerals, the carrying of the rock fragments and dissolved minerals to the ocean. And over the eons of time, the sea has grown ever more bitter with the salt of the continents. And then to begin to place us in the location of the paper, a quote from um, a mid-19th century manual to um, boat journeys along the Wieso, which is a river in Poland. Whose heart hasn't been struck by the Wieso's shores? Aren't these shores an open book of history? In August 2015, drought caused the Wieso, Poland's longest river, to fall to its lowest levels since records began in 1789. The drought performed an unexpected archaeology exposing long submerged riverbanks, so riverbeds, revealing Baroque marbles, a World War II Soviet fighter plane, and tombstones from a desecrated Jewish cemetery near Warsaw. Far upstream, close to its southern source, where the Sowa River meets the Wieswa, is the Auschwitz-Birkenau extermination camp. Much of the ashes from the crematoria were scattered into these rivers. So this is an image um, taken by American intelligence in 1944. And the history of this image is kind of well rehearsed by, in the film, in Harun Faroqi's film, the images of the world and the inscription of war, and in meant much of the writing of A.L. Weizmann. The scattering was done by the Zonderkommando, groups of predominantly Jewish men selected from transports and forced to carry out the processes of the gas chambers and crematoria. Zonda Commando testimony exists through the remarkable survival of members and the form of, the, of buried diaries and texts retrieved from the site. Often in improvised containers, some of these buried testimonies were themselves, like messages in bottles, thrown with the ashes into the rivers. In this paper, I want to consider the ways this river system and its turbulent and aggregating processes became the organizing element in two different yet confluent forms of violence and ask how the reduction of remains to ash and the pulverization of bone and scattering mimetically appropriated the sedimentary processes 
of the river in the obfuscation of the remains of genocide. By retro-navigating the appropriation of the river's agencies, I will propose that the turbulent, suspending, transporting, sultating and depositing river is itself an archive or even witness of violent events and their afterlives. Oh, sorry. This is um, an image of the, of the Sower, sort of in the top, in the top just beneath it says Auschwitz I. Ash has long been conceptualized as the very end of the vibrant body. In Impure Matter, a forensics of World Trade Center dust, Susan Shipley uses chemical studies to locate the traces of the human body within the vast clouds produced by the collapsed towers. The body was not, sorry, quote, the body was not missing in the images of swirling dust that we witnessed repeatedly those first few days after the tragedy, but was emphatically present within each specimen of dust at 1.3 parts per 100. For Shupley, dust has the potential to register events through its, quote, maintenance of a certain connectivity with the past. Indeed, as a compound material, Shipley writes, dust is a material witness par excellence because it maintains these heterogeneous distinctions to the end allowing them to be tracked back to the particular circumstances out of which they emerged, end quote. She goes on to quote the French criminologist and pioneer of forensic science, Edmond Locard, who considered dust as part of his exchange principle to be, quote, the mute witnesses, sure and faithful, of all our movements and of all our encounters, end quote. Certainly, the SS were aware of the potential for Ash to perform mute witness, the scattering of the ashes in the local rivers troubles Lacard's exchange principle, where ash, here in place of dust, no longer bears witness in the river in the same way that it had done in the terrestrial context. This ash was itself not an homogenous material. A specific group called the Ashen Commando were charged with pulverizing the bone found amongst the ashes. Shaul Khazan stated that they had to smash the bone until it was no larger than pieces of gravel, and then using wooden poles, they pulverized it until it was dust. Shlomo Dragon, a central witness for the Soviet Investigative Commission, emphasized the forensic effort. Not content with the reduction of the body to ash, they removed them, they, they removed them to make impossible any traces of the crimes. There were still bits of bone in the ashes. So this is from uh, Shlomo Dragon. Trucks came, the ashes were loaded onto them, and then thrown into the Sowa River, which was nearby. We also had to take care of the scattering of the ashes. We did it under SS guard. The path between the road used by the trucks and the river was covered with sheets of cloth so that not even a grain of ash would fall on the ground. To keep the ashes from sinking into the ground, the SS men wanted to throw it into the river and let the current carry them away, far away, we shook the sheets of cloth over the water and swept the place thoroughly, end quote. Other testimony describes this meticulous approach to the removal of the ashes. And what appears to be an awareness of the possible local sedimentation of the ash, one describes the cleaning of the banks of the river to prevent it sinking into the earth. More than this, the pulverization replaces, or replicates, sorry, the slow erosion of submerged bone. Water has long been the element of forgetting par excellence. The mythological pool of Nemosine was where the memories washed from the feet of those crossing the river Lethe collect. Out of the perceived inaccessibility of water, the pool of Nemosine performs a strange act of erasure, where from the initial radical material dispersal of entering the riverine space, the lost memories collect almost negentropically as fragments in the archival pool at the end of the river. But perhaps this mythologization has material truths, where river flows or currents are not only modes of obfuscation, but by contrast, act as what Astrida Neimanis describes as, quote, a memory keeper or archive storing flotsam, chemicals, detritus, sunken treasure, culture, stories, histories, end quote. 
Indeed, in Archaeology of Flow, Matthew Edgeworth comes to see the, quote, cultural affordances of rivers, just like solid artifacts. The difference is, is, that, is that their affordances tend to be associated with flowing energy rather than form. It is flow, as much as form, that is shaped and channeled for a vast range of instrumental uses. Edgeworth continues by asserting that it is in modern cultural perception that liquid is considered to lack the artifactual qualities so associated with solidity or indeed dryness. Can then the transfer of energy itself be seen as an organizing tool, both for erasure and as a mode of knowledge, such as the ways rivers organize sediments as what Manuel de Landa calls hydraulic computers or sorting machines? De Landa writes, rivers transport rocky materials from their point of origin an eroding mountain to the bottom of the ocean where these materials accumulate. In the course of this process, pebbles of various size weight and shape react differently to the water transporting them." End quote. He then goes on to describe the river's layering or sorting of homogeneous matter as in some way analogous to the ordering of social strata. I find this to be a somewhat overly naturalizing analogy and instead lean towards Luciana Parisi and Tiziana Terranova's assertion that while a tendency to order is inherent in matter, that this is always an unexpected and turbulent ordering. Sensing that these were turbulent fluvial processes then requires a multiplicity of approaches and actants. This includes knowledge of the physical proportions of the material entering the river. In stream ecology, organic matter is typically divided into three categories. Coarse particulate organic matter, which is that which is over one millimeter, fine particulate organic matter, that which is from um, one millimeter down to 0.5 of a micrometer, and dissolved organic matter, that which is beneath 0.5 of a micrometer. This is the hydrological spectrum of sedimentary erosion from the material to immaterial. The heterogeneous ashes scattered into the river would include elements of all three categories, from the crushed and burnt bones to the finest ashes. Each of these material categories operates differently as currents change. Likewise, they travel towards the sea at different speeds, depending on the height of the water and the space and incline of the river channel. The hydrologic transportation of submerged remains across large distances offers numerous problems for archaeologists. Tim Thompson and his colleagues have performed experiments recording the abrasive effects of different sediment classes, silt, sand, and gravel, Using microscopic methods, they observed evidence that the effect of abrasion from finer materials in saltation, the transport of particles in water flow, rounds the bone and softens its surface, while the fewer impacts made by coarser materials such as gravel will produce cracking. The, the laboratory findings were verified against samples recovered from subaquatic contexts. Observing at microscopic level the material changes these bone samples had undergone, the team were able to record the periods of immersion and the forms of erosion these bones had encountered. And yet, although, as Naimanis states in Water and Knowledge, quote, water returns and repeats, but always differently, end quote, this experimental laboratory study likewise evidences what she calls water's perpetuation of the impossibility of complete knowledge, an impossibility always buoyant on the partial knowledges of flow and sedimentary transportation, processes by which the already pulverized bone could be further eroded, rounded, and scarred. The Vizua sediment records deposits of yet other heavy waters, namely the history of industry alongside the river. Today, the coal mines and heavy industry that flank the Vizua dispense 9,000 tons of sulfates and chlorides into the river's flows each day. Similarly, water flowing through 60 and 80% of river segments in Poland exceed the respective standards for bacteria and chemical contamination. This segment of the river directly correlates with the Auschwitz-Birkenau complex and the concentration of heavy industry, including what was the Ige Farben chemical and Buna rubber works at subcamp 3 Monowitz, which is just here at the bottom here. 
now operating under the company Chemo Service Devori SA, it remains a large-scale factory concerned with the maintenance of machinery used in the chemical industry. As recently as 2005, it was the 164th largest company in Poland. Deborah Dvork and Jan van Pelt have highlighted the then chairman of IG Farben's committee for rubber and plastics, Dr. Otto Ambros's choice of the confluence of the Wiesla, Sova, and Przemysl rivers as ideal for the location of a factory requiring more than 525,000 cubic feet of water per hour. It was both access to slave labor and flow rate that originally attracted IG Farben to the site. The volume of water for discarding chemical waste continues to make industry possible. And so it was at this rate of turbulent flow that the river became operative for the obfuscation of the remains of industrial extermination. The elements that give chemical and cultural weight to these waters may lo no longer be discernible, but have become, across time, confluent, dispersed, diluted, and deposited in the river's currents and sediments. Here, the confluence of these materials in flows is itself a cultural artifact. In these heavy waters, radically different forms of violence, the industrially fast genocide and the relative slowness of toxicity remain imbricated as traces of, modern, of Western modernity in river sediment. Water, however, has a relational quality that also communicates its material contents to other entities. In the 2003 photographic series, The Odd Place, Polish artist and academic Elzabieta Janiczka attempted to capture the ash in AGFA film, which itself in 1925 was absorbed by Ige Farben. Janiczka's series, taken at the sites of the extermination camps, attempts to locate the persistent, if visually ephemeral, presence of the ashes. Here, material trace exists as atmospheric feedback. Through the photographic medium, Janiczka points to material absence narrated by the attempt to capture dust in the presence of the frame of the image. Zuzana Zwiban, in her paper on the political and social tensions between existing Polish communities and the macabre history of the extermination camp Wazetz, points to material relation to another in another unexpected area. She suggests that Janiczka's images retain a disturbing corporeality that is not only symbolic, but speaks to the continuing presence of the materiality of the ashes in ongoing relationships between the living and the dead. As Janiczka writes, the ashes flow in the air, we breathe the air, the ashes are in the soil, in the rivers, on the meadows, and in the forests, subjected to constant recycling in which we participate. These traces are encoded in the present processes within and between ecosystems. Zuiban weaves Janiczka's claims of exchange or relationality between the living and the dead into the context of archaeological research from the 1990s conducted at Wazetz. The study found that in the 1960s, a building was constructed in the vicinity of one of the mass graves. Tests showed that the well used by local residents contained human remains and thus the, quote, many families dwelling in the house, in the homes, or in the house for almost four decades had been drinking water containing the bodily remains of the dead, end quote. The relationality between the remains of the bodies and the material sites poses a further question. In addition to whether the body can be located in the site, can the site and the body ever be separated? For Zwiban, the living body unsettlingly acts as, quote, sarcophagi for the otherwise unburiable dead, end quote. Here, the relationality of the body feeds into post-war cultural tensions between Holocaust memory and Polish communities living near to sites of genocide. To conclude, in a perhaps albeit less bodily way, the Wiesla becomes a turbulent site of flow where different forms of violence become imbricated and continue to be confluent in the sedimentary afterlives of genocide. The question then arises, how might these sediments operate as witness? A sedimentary witnessing might be the ordering or aggregation like sediments of information, human and more than human in form, but also in this vein, where actual sediment operating 
both entropically and negentropically, narrate events and their multiple material and political implications. This might include the unsettling sedimentation in living bodies, or the implications of anthropogenic patterns of drought, or the continuing pollutants emitted by the factory as the persisting repetition of obviating and multi-scalar violences. In this way, the material process, rather than any material artifact or object itself, might have been appropriated as an unwitting accomplice or indeed witness to the events. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, could I invite uh, you both to uh, join me in these very comfortable chairs? Um, I think we have them for 10 minutes, so let's make the most of them. One, two. After two such uh, well-crafted presentations, uh, I'm going to stumble through some uh, a brief response. Um, I think it's um, it's fascinating to hear and what I anticipated would be complimentary presentations, but almost uh, described from. Um, contrasting perspectives, let's say. And there's a, f a few things which I sort of, uh, I think, overlap the presentations and others which made me think that uh, there's some uh, methodologically really interesting contrasts. Um, I was fascinated by, I suppose, the, the archival um, and sort of nature of the sediment that, that uh, Ifa, you described and made me, made, made me wonder whether that's what provided Lindsay's opportunity to sort of to research the fact that it contains information that it uh, allows us to understand um, something which otherwise might might not be accessible, um, and this idea of water um, I forget the quote water is an element of forgetting uh, also uh, pointing to the difficulty of researching at these contrasting scales and uh, accessing this information that the sediment holds. Um, and then there was the issue of representation, which I think both of you touched on, b both the importance of it and uh, the, the difficulty. Um, and uh, the relationship with politics I thought was quite fascinating. So sediment, uh, or the narratives of sediment, uh, that are both informed by political actions, uh, but also sediment informing uh, other actions. And I think this sort of the the what comes first, uh, the sediment of the politics, is quite interesting, um, and, and potentially that's the intentionality of the activity which is relating to sediment uh, or the, the resultant activities. Um, thought work could be, I think, endlessly interesting to unpack further. Um, in, in, in my nervousness and not having enough to say, I've made way too many notes and uh, I could go on. Um, and I'm not even going to give you an opportunity to respond, I think, because I think it would be a shame not to have some questions from the floor. So if, if through the questions on the floor, Lindsay, if or you'd like to respond, that would be great. Um, could we have a hand or two? Um, from uh, thank you, Tim. Let me give you the microphone. Um, I, I probably asked too soon because I'm not sure my question is quite framed yet. But the suspension of sediments in river waters uh, really affects the way that we encounter those waters and the way that we, um, the way that they see them, the way that they they, that, that they affect our imaginaries. It really struck me that the flash flood that you showed us um, had the qualities of custard or, or sauce, you know, it was really incredibly viscous sort of liquid. But there's also the colors that sediments impart on, on waters. I remember being very, very struck in Innsbruck in Austria that the river runs through and it's white. 
it's white with sediment, so it, it just has this incredible sort of purity. So I, I'm, I, I just wonder, it's not a question so much as uh, just that I'm wondering about the affective qualities of the suspension of sediments and the way that we encounter them. Yeah, amazing. Um, great question. I think. Um, I think. Yeah, I was. I was struck the other day. I was in the. I was just by the Thames. I just had this kind of strange experience, and then I was by the Thames, and and I was looking at the river, and it's no, no, no new thing to say that it was. It was not. It was murky, and it was clay-like, right? It, it was. It was thick and dense, and I definitely think that's really interesting. Touching then back onto what Lindsay said in your talk about um, the. Sediment doesn't exist within a geologic imaginary, and it doesn't exist within a kind of hydrologic imaginary. But then maybe does it exist in a kind of <laughs> fluvio-hydromorphic imaginary? Can there be such a thing, um, right? So that the river itself is this kind of conduit that exists between those two imaginaries, and maybe there is something about this kind of, then leading back to your point about memory or forgetting of water, is that it, it exists maybe between those two imaginaries, and so, and so is a place of forgetting. And so then how can, I mean, how can that imaginary be developed is kind of what I'm, I guess is kind of one of the things I'm really exploring is, um, yeah. To me, yeah, uh, the aesthetic of sediment, which we, we, I mean, the Mississippi, I think, is known as the Great Muddy and the Yellow River in China. So there is the strongest identification of rivers with their sediment, but we still think of them as rivers which are hydrological. So, you know, I think that this is worth thinking more about, you know, what kind of imaginary is a river mm. after all. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, another question, please. Don't make me pick on anybody. <laughs> Thank you, Christina. Uh, thanks, those are really great presentations, both of them. Um, this is half formed, but <laughs> um, since both of you really are talking about sediment um, in terms of movement, uh, flows, saltating, etc., um, I sort of, it makes me really question the use of strata in general, like I mean, as a term, as a kind of representation, and um, because well, strata implies, I mean, it's rock formation, like that something forms and it's there, and then something else forms on top and it's there. Whereas, for example, when we talk about soils, we use horizons uh, because they're growing. We accept the fact that they're sort of in a constant state of evolution and change. But, and really, at least to me, both of you are actually kind of saying that about sediment, right? That it's this uh, perpetually changing, moving, shifting thing. And that there, are granted, are different time scales, right, involved in, in it. But I, yeah, I just wonder how, if if you've thought along those terms, or, you know, yeah, what what does, if we, if we really examine sediment as a thing in motion, um, or a process in motion at various altitudes, what does that actually do to our understanding of strata, of layering? Christina, that's a great insight. I mean, I, I feel quite, I, I find giving up the idea of strata quite difficult because I think it's, it's, it's quite a strong idea conceptually in so many people's work. But I mean, as I've looked into sediment more and more, it, it, it kind of has raised those questions, you know. Um, you know, sediment gets more and more static as it gets more and more compressed. So if that's what strata is, then I think it's okay to think about strata. But bearing in mind that those very strata are unstable and subject to potential disruption constantly. I think, yeah, I've been trying to think about, I, I mean, initially when I was thinking about the paper, I was thinking about the river as a geologic agent and then how long does it take for these traces to enter into some kind of rock form or what, you know, whatever, which I just then kind of discarded because I realised that maybe that wasn't really the question I was asking. And I think actually the question was this idea of the contingency of, of, of flow rates and speeds and turbulence and, 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 and how these processes can themselves are actually information rather than being kind of just 
just discard it as, as a process that is ephemeral or, or not ephemeral, but kind of untraceable. And it's like, well, what's it, it's a process. We know how these processes operate. So, or we kind of know how they operate. So, um, yeah, that's kind of how I've certainly along those lines of moving away from starting with strata and trying to break, move backwards from it. Yeah. Yeah, I think this is uh, idea of the sort of the the change is fascinating. I was, I was taken by your quote, Lindsay, and um, describing sediments as the way the world recycles itself. I think that uh, um, yeah makes the de makes fixing a single definition very difficult. I think we have a question at the back. Let me. Uh, which is um, about how lost, how memories collect negentropically. So I understand F Lindsay's thing, alluvialism, life, death in a, in a cycle, but I'm just not sure how memories and witnessing, which would obviously involve some stratering, which is geology is based on um, sedimentary witnessing, how that can be negentropic, and um, what's actually happening when you're saying that um, memories are the same as life, and isn't there something possibly problematic with that? Because that's not, um, I don't see how that feeds into a negentropic process in, in your framing. I mean, I think it's kind of the way I'm, the way I came to this is to move away from. The, I mean, okay, contradicting what I've just responded to the, the previous question, but moving so thinking that all, that uh, things enter a river and then it's kind of an, an just pure entropy, or well, not pure entropy. That's probably a thing that I have no idea about. But that it's that it's only moving in an entropic way. But that so that it's not just eroding, but then it's also moving into negentropic processes of of aggregation, and then. And then maybe eroding again into entropy, um, but yeah, um, me memory as a negentropic thing is perhaps something that, if I've written it, maybe yes, you're right that I should not have. <laughs> mm. Did that answer? No. How can that archive be negentropic? Uh-huh. Um, because I think, because in those processes of, of moving, at, at also the process as an archive, and then either, either being mo turbulent, in turbulence, or then settling, and then being in turbulence again, it's shifting through different stages of that archive. So I'm not thinking of, like you say, ar an archive in a stable set or geologic sedimented sense, but as a process that shifts between ent between the movement and then kind of aggregation and back again. Okay, I think at uh, three minutes to six, uh, I'm going to. Uh, ask you to thank again our first two presenters um, and then recharge your cups of tea for our keynote uh, this evening. But uh, firstly, thank you, Ifor and Lindsay. <laughs>